Good evening. Welcome to Environmental Coffee House. And tonight, it's the four of us. You got the dream team here. We've got brains and beauty. <laughs> and actually, tonight, it's really serious. So I'm, I'm not going to make too much light of this. And I do want to say, though, that we do have um, Torstein uh, with us also, and he lives in Greenland. So his comments down in the uh, in the peanut gallery might be pertinent to our conversation. Um, tonight we are going to talk about the Arctic and we are going to talk about Greenland and we're going to talk about the peat and we're going to talk about all of these things so that you all that join us can understand the importance of what is happening and why it's not just, oh, it's up there, okay? So tonight we're gonna start with Antonio and I just want to do a quick hello. Oop, wait a minute. I just want to do a quick hello to Kim and Buddy and Karen and Larry and and whoever's going to join us. Thank you. And Antonio, good evening. All right. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, and thank you all again for joining us here at the Environmental Coffee House. Uh, today's presentation is about the ongoing crisis in the Arctic. Uh, for my segment, I'm going to talk about. Uh, more generally what's happening in climate change and what's happening uh, in the Arctic. Uh, so it was about in the 1990s when we first began to detect the Arctic amplification signal. That is to say that scientists, atmospheric scientists, uh, began to realize that atmospheric temperatures uh, were rising faster in the Arctic than elsewhere in the world. Uh, paleoclimate data has also backed this up that during times of extreme global warming, uh, the poles do tend to warm faster than the mid-latitudes and equatorial regions on planet Earth. Recently, we've been witnessing heat waves, uh, extreme heat anomalies in the Arctic, uh, ranging from places like Burrow, Alaska, uh, to the Yamal Peninsula in Siberia, uh, to parts of the Canadian archipelago as well. Uh, these temperatures have been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, just recently, uh, the GISS model by NASA was able to uh, calculate that some temperatures off of the coast of the uh, Ellesmere Island in uh, the Canadian archipelago were up to 41, 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this is particularly distressing because uh, right off the coast of these islands, uh, up and around Greenland as well, uh, is where the thickest part of the Arctic, uh, the Arctic sea ice is, is kind of embedded. And so what this does is it serves to kind of weaken its attachment to the land features uh, and causing possibly a complete destabilization of the Arctic sea ice uh, mass itself. Um, we've also realized that over the last uh, 25 years, that significant volume of the Arctic ice has disappeared as well. Um, the recession of the ice and the disappearance of the ice has affected uh, weather patterns around the Arctic and in the mid-latitudes, uh, giving way to a lot of the heat phenomena that we've seen just recently. Uh, just in the month of July, we saw temperatures in Anchorage, Alaska uh, reach 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, uh, throughout this week, uh, Alaska will also be experiencing extreme heat. Um, the European heat wave has also caused perturbations in uh, the Arctic region as well. Uh, giving rise to extreme temperatures. Uh, in short, the shallow seas are warming. Uh, the shallow seas are warming off of the coast of Siberia, uh, East Siberia. They're warming off the coast of ba uh, Barrow, Alaska. They're warming off the coast of Greenland. And they are warming off the coast of the Arctic and uh, Apelago. We're also seeing significant amounts of heat energy transferred into the Arctic region through the Fram Strait. Uh, and all this activity is causing a major recession of, of the ice. As the ice recedes, uh, we're also seeing a darkening of the Arctic. Uh, as the Arctic darkens, it warms faster, causing greater recessions in the ice. Um, and it's kind of this feedback, feedback that is uh, dominating uh, weather patterns in, uh, in the Arctic region. Um, so I'm going to pass it over now to Jennifer to talk a little bit about uh, what that means for uh, local ecosystems in the Arctic uh, and some of the wildfires that we've been seeing. 
Thank you, Antonio. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Antonio. I appreciate that. Um, I really feel that we're at such a tipping point right now that is so visual and things that used to be um, wet and cold like ice and permafrost are now becoming dry and hot and the peat especially is of huge concern because that was all permafrost and it's it's thawing so quickly now and um it's just such a visual tipping point because these fires are self-igniting and the arctic all across Siberia, up in Alaska, and even in Greenland, and you would never expect there would be fires in Greenland, are raging. And that should just like make us say, what? I mean, really, We're, we've got raging fires in Siberia and northern Canada and all these places, as Antonio had mentioned, were under a huge heat dome and that Sahara heat just shot right up into the Arctic. And heat plus ice equals water and mush and things getting dried out. And this is such a scary thing because these fires can be started by anything. They can be started by a thunderstorm, by a lightning strike, you know, and if the conditions are right, which they are, it's hot and dry, then, you know, things just start igniting. And that's what we're seeing. And I think this is huge. And I think that also the fact that we up in the Arctic, the Arctic sea ice, um, extent and volume both are on a steep, steep decline, but especially what's so notable is that the Arctic sea ice volume and thickness and, you know, is very, very low. So that's, you know, that's just what I'm seeing. I'm, I mean, I'm seeing such a, a radical and dramatic <clears throat> point. And I also see an awakening of the public consciousness around the severity of climate change. And it's finally been allowed into the thought process that we may have gone too far. And um, there is such um, kind of like a consciousness blossoming around the um, whole environmental issue where we are as a, as a world. And, Everybody is, a lot of people are starting to get engaged. And even if they're not consciously engaged on a subconscious level, this thing is so big that they have to know about it, you know. So that's that's kind of what I'm seeing. I think it's, it's an amazing thing to be witnessing this right now. And it's very difficult for us to really comprehend what our life would be like in a world without ice in a world where the Arctic sea ice cover has gone and is absent for several months a year, you know, what that might do to the overall global temperature and what kind of methane stores that that might release. Um, you know, so this is like a very kind of sobering time yeah. as I see it. And it's kind of a time of, of what it is. Well, Jennifer, 500,000 acres is what I read in just one area, 500,000 acres burning. And underneath that is burning the peat, which I would like to hear Nicholas talk a little bit about um, if that's uh, okay, Nick, and you could maybe talk about the composition and why the carbon is so heavy. Yeah, um, the, the first thing I'll, I'll mention is that, um, with regards to uh, climate change, just in general, it, 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 we're, I think we're really starting to see, you know, uh, from a, from me from my perspective as a meteorologist, who you know, meteorology in and of itself typically deals with short term, shorter term events. We're starting to see climate change become so abrupt; it's showing up in in huge signals on meteorological time scales, and that's something that I've spoke about in the past. And, you know, with regards to the destabilizing jet stream and things of that nature, the, most of the things we're seeing are being, um, are increasing in, in either magnitude, the intensity or the frequency because climate change is, is getting worse and it's getting worse so fast that you're seeing 
these effects on on time scales that matter to people uh, on a on a day to day, week to week, year to year basis. Um, and it the the peat in in the Arctic is very concerning because it's essentially very <clears throat> very um, it's not true soil, but it's um, it's uh, plant matter and other ma uh, carbon, you know, organic material that didn't completely decompose. So it's extremely carbon rich and um, and and very combustible. But it's it's one of those uh, things that as long as it's wet, it's not an issue. And it's been either wet or frozen for thousands of years. But now you have huge swaths of of Russia, Siberia right now that have been going through drought conditions, um, extreme heat for that region, 80s, 90 degree weather, and it just dries out. And they've been having uh, uh, tons of thunderstorms move through the area in, in previous weeks and they ignite the fires. So and it's dry and they're dry thunderstorms. The thunderstorms aren't producing a ton of rain, but they're producing a, a fair amount of lightning to, wow. to cause them to, to the peat and the surface vegetation to ignite and produce these these uh, terrifying fires. I mean, they, the fires, you know, I, they're just so huge that they're producing copious amounts of smoke and soot over much of central and eastern Siberia. And, you know, I mean, there are towns that are just swamped in smog from uh, so many fire uh, fire related smoke clouds moving over the areas. And uh, doesn't the soot also land on the ice mm -hmm. and take away the albedo effect as well? Right. I mean, it, it's uh, it's two effect. It's uh, obviously local effect is is air pollution and people ch really choking on the smoke and you know, potentially dying. And who knows if they'll ever be accounted for in the terms of, of deaths related to to these fires. But then, yes, the smoke goes over the Arctic Ocean and, and goes over the ice, deposits on the ice and darkens the ice. We're talking both the sea ice and the Greenland ice sheet too. And so because of that, the whole feedback loop of melting and, and warming and melting gets accelerated by not only the blue ocean becoming more typical in the Arctic Ocean, but also the darkening of, of all of the ice in that area and and we've seen significant reduction in albedo from soot, meltwater, um, yeah, and algae, surface algae that grows on top of the ice in the Greenland ice sheet that darkens it. And obviously uh, soot uh, moving over the Arctic Ocean itself and, and depositing over the ice. So these fires, I mean, this, um, for me, you know, the, the fires up there, that's, that's really the first true carbon bomb you know, not, um, you know, we're starting to see more and more methane seep out of the the eastern, the East Siberian Arctic shelf right now. And in other places, actually, you know, lots of methane starting to seep out. Uh, but the, for, for me to see this kind of activity, this kind of release of carbon on the land mm -hmm. that, you know, as, as a, you know, in, in, in meteorology or climatology, you, you, you look at land being capable of cooling itself faster than the water. So you think, okay, if the you're gonna get these huge releases of carbon, it's probably going to be from the subsea permafrost because it's submerged in this warming ocean water all year round. And you're getting more methane seeping out, but it, the fact that it's not getting cold enough in the winter in many places to refreeze the permafrost once it's been thawed. And then you're getting these really hot summers, you're getting these uh, intense drying conditions which dry out the peat and you're getting as a result massive hun you know you know tens of millions of acre <laughs> fire I mean it, it's it's huge I, I, you know, I can't I just can't stress enough how big it is I mean there Putin's finally wants to send in the Russian army to go tackle the fires I don't know it's way way too late <laughs> now because they're so huge I don't know yeah. what the heck they're gonna be able to do now. You know, and think about time. all of the all of the uh, the ecological effects and what's happening, yeah. you know, with the wildlife up there, and then the the irreversible damage to the ecosystem after the fires, if they do, yeah. when they do go out. 
Yeah, okay. I mean, you're talking about local effects and distant effects. So local effect would be obviously the wildlife that depended on the ecosystem forest. Forests are being destroyed. The soil is being, being roasted in the fires. Um, but then you have the distant effects being the soot going over the sea ice, destroying the sea ice, and the sea ice provides, um, you know, provides various ecosystem services for larger life. And I mean, there's a reason why we're seeing birds, whales being, you know, just they're dying off because the ocean where the ice would be is getting too warm. I think there's ice bearing um, plankton or algae that is you that is on the bottom of the food chain. They have no ice to sit on because it's melting. And obviously polar bears need ice. It's just the sea ice itself serves a purpose. And so, um, and I, you know, if you don't have it, then, then a lot of species that depend on it start dying off in mass numbers. That's what we're witnessing right now. The part that could fit, it, it, it mm -hmm. makes me want to cry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's and, very bad. And, and, and I'd like to kind of segue in on that just a little bit and how much these fires and all the soot and all the huge, huge amount of carbon dioxide, I, I mean, they're just like massive, how much that is speeding up the, the process with these self-reinforcing feedbacks mm -hmm. and possibly triggering other things. I mean, this is a ginormous um, ecologic crisis that's happening right now. Yeah, I mean, Antonio, I have a really quick one. You're out there, you know. You're you're in, in the academic world. Is this being discussed? I don't think this is being discussed nearly as much as it deserves to be, um, because first of all, it's hard to keep up, and it's also hard to communicate to people what exactly is going on. Yeah, I I I, I, I can tell among some of the scientists meteorologists, climatologists in particular on, on Twitter, which tends to have a lot of active discussion communication uh, that there's a, some, there's alarm rising, you know, I mean, there's definitely people are getting alarmed about it, um, about what's happening. I mean, all of it, the, 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 the ridiculous losses of sea ice. I mean, basically you're having a blue, you're having blue ocean events in the Bering and sea and, and North into the, into the Buford sea and those areas where it's just like ice is just, fading into nothing really fast. Um, and, you, and, you, and then the fires are, are ridiculous. You know, so I can tell that there's um, a ton of alarm starting to go on. But uh, at the same time, I don't know if any, if real, people are really talking about abrupt climate change. Nobody's really either, either understanding or they don't want, they're not, they're choosing not to communicate the message that it's getting worse much faster. You hear residents talking about that, like people that live in these areas, particularly in the, in the Arctic where it's the fastest in the world, talking about, oh, it's getting worse the past couple of years. This is definitely climate change. This is just crazy, you know, it's insane. But then the, the, the scientific conservatism is, is gotten to the point where it's pulling, it's pulling, pulling it back in the, in the wrong, in the opposite direction too much. You know, there's a point where you when you want to make sure not to not to go too far, but it it's being recoiled to the point to where it's not you're not really communicating effectively what is actually right. happening, which is abrupt climate change, where you're getting changes in the climate on the scale of years. Like there was a I, I saw yesterday there was a uh, a client a climate uh, climatologist in Alaska that posted on Twitter three photo or three images of the sea ice graphics showing the sea ice extent on July 31st of 1718 and 2019 showing how it was bad in 2017 recovered a little bit in 2018 was still quite bad. And now it's even worse in 2019. And he, and he was emphasizing, Oh, this is three years. Isn't climate change. It's inner annual variability. Technically he's correct, but in the context of the past, 30, 40 years, and then the context of 10 years, in the context of past five, and three, and two, and one, it's accelerating. The loss of ice is accelerating. The loss of ice, like sea level, 
are like the best indicators of a warming planet. And if it's going faster, that means your planet is warming faster. Even if it's not fully reflected in the, in the global average temperature, if you're losing ice, that's heat that's going into melting the ice. If your oceans are warming, that's heat that's going into warming the oceans and right, making them rise faster. Right. It's climate change. <laughs> it's not just variability. There's variability in the climate change, but it's climate change. It's right. Rapid. It's rapid. It's fast and going faster. And so I think that the, the, there's some kind of difficulty messaging that for some reason or people or scientists just really don't want to hammer that because they don't want to freak people out. But people are getting freaked out either externally or internally. And they're not admitting that they're freaked out about the, the crazy weather, you know, as they might call it. Like here on the plains, you might have farmers that politically don't believe in climate change, but they'll talk about the cra- weather's getting crazier or the rains have gotten worse. You know, and, you know, they know without, but they've been, you know, they, they have a lot of political propaganda in their heads right. against climate change, but they know what's happening. They have to, you know. So the same thing with people in, in Alaska, or in Siberia, you know, regardless of any climate change denial po- issues politically, <clears throat> knows what's happening. Um, I'd like to I put up. To, I'm sorry, Cindy. I, I, I just go ahead. I wanted to put up William Harmony's Harmony's comment, but we could come back to William because he does ask the question about action <laughs> and uh, instead of just daily events, and we do get there. You know, there are things happening, but we'll get there, Antonio. Well, I just wanted to follow back up with your earlier question about the mm-hmm. academic response to this. Um, I, I think part of the problem, at least from my experience, is that uh, academics is hyper specialized and climate change is this whole encompassing thing. Um, as I think about it, climate really touches every aspect of the Earth's uh, surface. Okay, and it has uh, very huge impacts on on really then everything that 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 you think about that really is responsible for our civilization, for our own biological lives, for you know human habitat, and so it's really hard to talk about um, just this huge encompassing thing because your knowledge on it is so specialized. So people like Dr. James Hansen can talk about uh, ice melt and atmospheric dynamics, but he can't really talk about, well, what does that mean for the population of India as as they face these uh, heat waves? What does that look like in terms of uh, political instability? What does that look like in terms of war and conflict? Now, there are other aspects of, uh, uh, of academia that do try to address this in the social sciences, which are just scratching the surface. Um, but a lot of times what we see is, um, first of all, the actual climate scientists are, are, are in some ways lagging behind what's happening in the climate. Uh, but then you just see this as a further preservation down the way. So the social scientists just assume that, you know, IPCC is the latest, greatest. And so then their social theories, they're based off of what's happening in IPCC. And so they, you know, you know talking about, oh, uh, we're expecting to see 50 percent more conflicts by the end of the century, but their idea of the end of the century is is based on a two degree Celsius rise. Sure. Um, and so it's kind of hard to fathom as as we're starting to realize, as, as Nick was saying, that climate change is this thing that's going faster and faster. And not only we are realizing that it's going faster, we're also realizing that each of the stages of climate change uh, are, are more impactful than we originally thought. Um, <clears throat> So before there was a solid consensus that two degrees Celsius uh, was the upper. We knew that two degrees would be absolutely dangerous. And that was in 75 William Northout. Um, but 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 really what we're seeing at a one degree world is we this is not a place where we can remain. Uh, this is a place that is destabilizing populations. This is a place that is attacking viciously um, our food supplies around the world. This is the part that is driving ecosystems uh, to to the brink. Um, so this is not a safe place to be. But then try to, you know, as a social scientist, talk about a magnitude warmer 
uh, of what what does human society look like in a two degree Celsius world? Uh, and what does that mean in very real terms for the people in which we're, we're telling this to? Because mm -hmm. obviously you're in college, you're talking to 20 year olds, you know, so whatever you say it's happening in 2050 or 2060, this is well within their lifetimes, you know? Uh, so it's very difficult to explain uh, essentially that we we now put so much forcing into the atmosphere that we're pushing the atmosphere back uh, something like 50 to 150 million years by the end of the century. Um, and, and we're going to bear witness to all of that change. And we can see the perturbations of that change in the extreme, excuse me, in the extreme wildfires. Um, that's what it looks like. These ecosystems are responding to pushing the atmosphere back millions of years each decade. Um, we just got recently a report out of California. Well, the California wildfires of 2018 uh, talk about feedbacks, they admitted as much CO2 in the atmosphere as the entire state over that year. Mm -hmm. So just at a time where, <laughs> excuse me, just at a time where we ought to be reducing emissions as fast as we possibly can, uh, we might be at a place where I call breakaway. And that's where, uh, as we reduce our emissions, uh, the Earth's emissions ramp up uh, to replace our emissions and then soon to surpass them. Uh, and I think that we're right around that precipice uh, where we're going to start to really see that. And these wildfires are, are really good purviews into that because, uh, I mean, the wildfires in, in Siberia, I mean, these are untouchable. Humans are not out there uh, battling these blazes. Uh, and then look at what um, <clears throat> I think they call them hot shots uh, in Colorado and Washington State and, and, and the, in, the mid, in the far west. Uh, look at what they're saying about the wildfire season. Look at what they're saying about what's happening in mm -hmm. fires in the United States. And these fires are much smaller than the ones that we're seeing in British Columbia and the ones that we're seeing in, in Siberia. Oh, the ones in Siberia are, are just, it's just, it's horrifying. And uh, I, I mean, I did read that uh, the United States had offered, I guess, to go up if, if needed. Uh, to help battle the fires, but I, I don't know how accurate that source was. But I, I wanted to get a little bit back to William because he said, and I'll put it up, where are the action plans? Besides talking about the daily events, where is the coordination from the collective? Well, William, there's a lot of coordination from the collective, but collectively, that has to be put together. I mean, uh, I don't know if in a show like what we're doing right now, we actually can answer each different group, but I'm always of the opinion that all these groups, we don't have time and, and <coughs> the climate mobilization that everybody has to get together and force this issue. But <coughs> Jennifer, you have a, you have a, uh, a thought on that? Well, yeah, I mean, on a personal level, you know, I mean, there are a couple of different levels. That you, can, you know, we're all reacting to this. And even if we're convinced that this problem is too big to, to successfully overcome, there's kind of like a personal reaction that you mm -hmm. have. And it takes various forms. And so um, some of us might just really strive to be carbon neutral, not because we think that our one person being carbon neutral is is going to really affect anything, but right. at least we're touching that which is immediately around us. So like on a kind of personal level, you can control your personal thing. And so I've recently been striving a lot in that area and succeeding actually quite a bit in that area. Um, then there's your kind of more global response and that's how we inter network with everybody like we're doing here tonight, right. spreading knowledge. And that in turn kind of seeds the base because we're very much a grassroots operation. You don't see abrupt climate change being spoken about a lot um, yet except every so often they'll have like little nuggets of it. But that's what we're doing here. And we're kind of seeding the consciousness. So, so something could happen because right now, I mean, if you have your government still denying that climate change 
is is a problem that's that's a problem right there you know and so we're, we're dealing with a lot of forces we're dealing with the innate selfishness and fear that kind of inhabits humanity and that's very much over to very, a lot for us to overcome you know we've never really been a particularly selfless race but it's going to require a jump in our awareness and the understanding that this is an important enough issue that we can start to network because it's not like i mean you can either smash into the wall at 200 miles an hour or you can smash into the wall less fast i don't know how but i mean you're probably going to end up smashing into the wall might be fatal but i mean at least do something to try and mitigate your landing and and also education is very 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 important and i think that there are so many videos out there now that the education aspect is really reaching into the public center and it's really starting to shift awareness as to the seriousness of our predicament and, and encouraging people to take a look at it. Those who feel that they want to wake up, the opportunity is there. That's kind of what And yeah, let me say uh, on my own behalf here is that, you know, I've been engaged in since 2016 and I graduated college in 2017 um in this effort to reduce um our uh university admissions at Appalachian State University uh our school admits like 70,000 metric tons of CO2 or greenhouse gas equivalent into the atmosphere each year um you know this is representatively the emissions of 20,000 students um whatever I do here is going to have a much more significant impact than anything I could do in my own personal life and this is something that I've been actively engaged in um, mm -hmm. for a very long time, almost immediately when I found out that we were in a climate crisis. So uh, honestly, there are some people who I feel like uh, they, they're kind of getting into uh, an, an apocalypse type porn uh, mm -hmm. where, where they want to hear about all these horrible things, but mm -hmm. they, they really haven't been moved to act. And that's because I think that you have to connect personally with what's happening. Um, you can't just be a bystander and kind of watch this to a TV screen. Um, when I came back home from Appalachian, I, I realized that I'd come back home to a place, my own backyard, that was very different. Um, I came back home to a state that was threatened by uh, two catastrophic hurricanes in the same year. Mm. Um, I came back to a state where even one of my family members' houses were washed away and become part of our state. Uh, so I, I was very aware that what this was, what was going on, and I immediately felt the urge and the sense to uh, do something about it. And a lot of that something actually, actually has to do with talking. Mm -hmm. One thing that I didn't realize, and people uh, now over the last four years have kind of come up to me and said so, um, was that uh, I've changed their lives. And these are really incredible things for people to be saying to me, but it, I changed their lives in the sense that I introduced them to this very real situation, this very real topic. And what I've seen from that is a ripple effect, um, that people get engaged at, at different levels, that people get engaged over different time spans. But when people get engaged, uh, the first thing they do is, is tend to talk. And there's a power of the spoken word the spoken word helps us understand a, a narrative of our reality. Um, so in that sense, talking about this is super, super important, especially at a time. Um, if you're watching the Democratic debates over the last two days, um, <clears throat> to me, that is almost like a total representation of untruth, right? So we are right now in the midst of an epic climate crisis, and that, that's hardly a discussion. Um, the, the one thing that, that was kind of a saving grace was that Medicare for all, providing health care for all your citizens was a discussion, but it was under vicious attack. So, so, so when it comes to human health and planetary health, those are just not conversations that our political system is willing to take seriously um, other than a few people. And, and some of those people are getting a voice. And that tells you something about uh, what's happening in the country, because whether or not CNN is ever going to admit this, and I don't think CNN will, Mm -hmm. um, but majorities of the U.S. population are becoming increasingly concerned about climate change. 
um, like Nick was just recently saying, um, you know, a lot of the farmers in the Midwest, they're seeing what's happening. You know, they don't have the scientific vernacular to talk about, um, you know, differences in, 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 in humidity and differences in um, how much, you know, water vapors in the atmosphere due to, you know, whatever amount of temperature rise. But they see what's happening in terms of their ability to plant their crops. They see what's happening in the ability uh, of them to harvest their crops. They see what's happening in the stability of the soils. Uh, all of this they're witnessing. You know, we're just watching historic amounts of rain fall on uh, the heartland of the country. Uh, these things are being observed by average people just today. Um, I was at the store and some of my local friends are talking about a storm that happened yesterday, totally out of the blue, um, dropping quarter size hail uh, on one of our cities here. Um, so, so people are definitely talking about this. Mm. Yes. You know, <clears throat> I, I wanted to say something when I think about the four of us and how we've come together, each one of us has done this. Each one of us has talked. Each one of us has reached people. And we're together here for a reason, reaching more people. And, and so that counts for something. Jennifer, with your work, amazing work. And Antonio with yours and Nicholas, oh my gosh, you know. And me, just with the gift of gab, bringing along the, the people that were like me, unenlightened, clueless, and opened our minds. So this is how it happens. Because three years ago, I wasn't talking about this and look at look at now and Lori who's with us and and Karen Reese who's with us you know so this is how it starts and then everybody has the ability to participate in something locally that they can do without regards to the end result like I always say because we can't control the end result can we but we can control what we do right now and today I just wanted to add. Um, I was looking at the live comments, and I, mm -hmm. I can, uh, I can see uh, William's frustration with the uh, lack of like, like global coordination. Uh, I think, you know, for me, when I look at the the state of the atmosphere, I'm looking at the state of, you know, of the atmosphere of the environment as it, as it will be, and not just as it is now. And and for me, the only, I don't really see a path out of. Out of um, the out of getting out of the severity of climate change, this is going to get much much worse. But as far as like acting on a global scale, the only thing to me that would be uh, anywhere effective would be would be um, um, retreat, <laughs> meaning retreat of civilization. Um, that's the that's the only thing that I see would be any in any way sort of. Um, um, re respective of the situation, because 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 it, you you can you can build more stuff, try to do more technology, try to do this and that, but at the end of the day, all you're doing is producing more um, waste, you know, greenhouse gases, waste from mining, waste, and that hurts more of nature. And if we if we as a human species really cared about um, you know, this includes me, you know, this includes every single one of us on the planet. If we, you know, it, it comes down to understanding that regardless of how our, our species does, whether we make it through this or not, meaning we don't go extinct or not, we understand that the future is to uh, keep, try to keep nature from being killed off yeah. <laughs> as much as possible. And the only way to do that is to not take any more land uh, yeah, you can uh, plant more trees, more plants. Uh, who, I mean, who knows whether they'll survive or not, but it's better than doing nothing at all. Um, uh, they'll try to retreat from industrial agriculture and retreat from, you know, just doing a global drawdown. The problem is, is that humans for 10,000 years have never thought of anything like that. We've always wanted to grow, you know, we wanted to grow and and not only our numbers, everyone talks about like population growth, but in our power, you know, our ability to control nature, to protect ourselves from nature, to use nature for our bidding. Um, and, you know, and, and, and this is the result of that. The end re It may be the end result of it, 
is what we're witnessing right now. Um, the destruction of nature to the point that it will kill, kill us. And that, that's really the only thing I can see. Even small things like I, you know, I, you can go to any city and you see more and more buildings going up. You know, why is Miami building more stuff along its coast? Why? Like why I, I, Miami is, in my view, regardless of, of anything else that could make climate change much worse, much faster, like the methane or anything, I don't see Miami being a viable city in, in 30 in 20 to 30 years. You're going to have so much flooding that they can't, mm. that city can't function. I know people that live in Miami. I know people that live in Florida. I know people that live, you know, all over coastlines. That's just the coastline. Why are we not uh, turning some of those coastlines into uh, land use that can just flood on its own and people retreat to other places inland, you know, a, I mean, why wait till the city towns just don't function anymore? The, everything is about just growing and not only in num numbers, but in power and taking over more and doing more with less and less and less and less and until you crash. And why, why wait for that when it could kill a whole bunch of people, but also kill a whole bunch of other species and it's a concept that when you, when you look at like the presidential debates and in the discussions in the United Nations, it's it's a concept that is completely alien to humans. It's I mean, heck, it's alien to me. You know, I you know, it's it's alien to most people. And I maybe it's because humans were just never evolved to think that way. You know, I mean, maybe we just aren't evolved to think that way, but. From an intellectual viewpoint, it's really the only thing I could think of that would be in any way um, mildly effective, even at making things go a little bit longer in a little bit more um, um, humane way for fellow humans, for species, other species, and uh, uh, respecting nature. Um, but that, that's, really, that's really the only thing, and it has to be done on a global scale. And, and you, I don't see United States, see. Russia, Britain, you know, all these other countries coming together and being like, let's yeah. let's just draw down civilization. Let's degrowth. Let's go down one or two percent per year instead of three percent increase in the economy per year. That uh, no. then <laughs> we have countries like uh, yeah. uh, Brazil, where you read every day that they're just you know they're just stomping their feet and and saying we don't care. Yeah, they're butchering the rainforest, basically. Yeah. I mean, they're just going in there, it's taking what they want, killing. I heard about a, a, a tribal chief that got murdered down there and so they could take over a mine. I mean, it's just it's crazy. I have it's a question crazy. for you, Aunt, uh, 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 Nicholas, about that. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe any all of you can answer. What are the ramifications of losing, and I probably know this, but losing that rainforest as it goes to what's going on up in Siberia and the Arctic? Um, as far as the rainforest, I've I've heard estimates that it provides you know twenty percent of the world's oxygen. It, it it controls the water cycle in in South America in the in the that area of the tropics. So you destroy it, you turn it into a savanna, and really it might. Depending on how abrupt the changes are, it might just become an arid desert-like region, um, and you end up drying out areas that currently get rainfall because of the Amazon. You kill, you destroy the biodiversity of that region. I mean, it's just bad, I mean, and, and also you don't um, have carbon sequestration there anymore. You know, I mean. It, the, the rainforest does so much better than a savanna could do or a desert. So that would make climate change accelerate even faster without the Amazon rainforest. Uh, it's an absolute catastrophe. So, so it's like, I'm watching, I'm watching the destruction of the boreal forest and of peatland in Siberia and simultaneously to that, another carbon sink, the Amazon rainforest is being is already being damaged by climate change. You're getting more droughts down there, like catastrophic droughts, but it's now being destroyed purposely, purposely being destroyed by a, a, a basically an authoritarian government. Um, 
um, in, in Brazil. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. You know, to me, this is really uh, to think about, you know, we're going to be, I think, you know, we're somewhere right now between what, two and three parts per million of CO2 introduced into the atmosphere each year now. Um, so if we, if we start to see these drastic losses uh, of the uh, forest cover in the Amazon, we're going to see, I think, higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere simply because we're not dragging atmospheric CO2 down. Um, but, but, but what's really happening, I think, it, with Bolsonaro, what's happening with Trump, and what's happening actually across the Western world altogether, is a type of great derangement, a type of political denial of, of this of this the great derangement of, of this problem. Um, as as real as the problem asks for us, there are equal <laughs> forces who want to drown this out, that want to deny that this is happening, and they'll do everything they can um, to, to, to try to dismiss this, including the exact opposite behaviors uh, that will actually just make the crisis worse. Um, and we should expect to see that parts of our species will, will have this type of uh, spastic reaction to, to dealing with crises. Um, and then, of course, there will be strong men that will come up too. Um, but, but why have we seen a lack of international collaboration? Well, that actually actually uh, is, is kind of a theater that I can speak to being an international and political science uh, major from Appalachian. Um, so I think it has to do with the last 80 years of kind of uh, Western intellectual and uh, international history. Um, right after the Second World War, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and notice that during great moments of war, like the First World War, the Second World War, these are actually moments, uh, kind of ironically, where countries actually come together and collaborate uh, in doing something. And this case is, uh, in, in these cases, a lot of times they're collaborating in mass destruction, uh, but nonetheless, they're, they're collaborating on uh, different type of military weaponry technology, uh, whether that be airplanes or whether that be uh, nuclear engines or the nuclear bomb itself. Uh, but these are uh, times where uh, huge swabs or, or at least governments are working together to mm -hmm. come to certain goals. Um, but even more importantly is the kind of cleanup effort, which is even a more kind of entrenched moment of coordination between countries when we have to uh, issue a Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe or when we help rebuild uh, Japan or South Korea, uh, examples like that. So what happened with the climate crisis? Well, um, the, the, the whole story, I think, kind of takes place in the United States uh, because we're kind of leading the world order uh, after the Second World War, and we're kind of the head of all these uh, moments of collective action. Um, you know, you see the United States in the 1960s and 1970s actually being very progressive on the environmental front, uh, leading the war on the fight against the ozone depletion. Um, and, and you see things like that come together. But what happens is about in the 1980s, the United States goes through a political reformation. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States uh, brings uh, to the House uh, Ronald Reagan which in a lot of ways, he is a second type of prototype of the Nixon phenomena. Uh, and, and later the Reagan phenomena would become the Trump phenomena. These, these are the same type of presidential yeah. entities in our society. Um, and what does Reagan do? He comes to, to the United States, he comes to the White House and he rips off solar panels off the White House as a demonstration that science isn't real. Um, that, that, that the data coming out of NASA, the data coming out of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration are not real. Um, and so this is a president, another reality show, movie star-esque president uh, coming to the American people to say, no, reality is not real, an alternative reality is real. Uh, and so we, we totally lose the 1980s as a decade to seriously talk about uh, how we could begin moving away from uh, emissions. Um, but this whole kind of sentiment's driven by a corporate culture that was under threat. Uh, and who's leading this corporate culture? Uh, Dutch Shell, Exxon Mobil, uh, okay. uh, and they're also leading the science in this. And so at the same time, the political scientists are seeing what's called predatory capture. Um, that is the corporate control of civic regulatory agencies 
we're starting to see an increasing denial of climate science as well. Uh, and a complete adication of responsibility on the part of the state to respond um, to the threat of climate science. So we get an IPC, or Dr. James Campbell comes out in 1989, um, and at the time he's the director of the Goddard Institute for NASA Space Studies, and he's talking about we face climate catastrophe by the middle of the next century. Um, and, and even from that early point, people realized that, that the trajectory we were on was extremely dangerous. Um, by 1990, the uh, IPCC released its first assessment report um, stating unequivocally that the atmosphere is warming and humans are the cause. And at the Rio summit in 95, what was the United States doing? The United States was working, its advisors were working, trying to downplay the effects of, of, of a two degree world uh, and moving us away from collectively agreeing that two degrees was a dangerous place for us to be. And then what happened in 2000? Uh, we had a warning 10 years before in 1990 from the UN that we really had about a 10 year window of opportunity to collectively and actively consciously respond to this. And what do we get in 2000? Another uh, perturbation of the Trump phenomenon, George W. Bush, what he come out and say. Uh, the jury's still out on climate change. Uh, the jury was not out on climate change. It was not out in the National Academies of Science or nor NASA. Uh, the United States was, was leading the way in climate science. Um, and, and what happened during this time? Uh, we saw us go in the opposite direction. Um, very, very little funding to uh, renewables happened during, during this time very little collaboration, complete failure at the Kyoto Protocol. But then look what happened under President uh, uh, Obama. Under President Obama, we got into this this, this era of, it was really, to me, this uh, insidious type of, I feel your pain language of liberalism being espoused to the population. And we spoke to the issue of climate change, but in reality, what do we see? The Obama administration had increase fossil fuel production by 88% over, over the Bush years, uh, that Obama would ultimately open up the Arctic to Dutch Shell for oil exploration. Um, and ultimately the Copenhagen uh, Accords would fail under President Barack Obama. And then Obama, like his predecessor Clinton, would lead a decision of entering in the global uh, uh, treaty to really his, his, his predecessor, which didn't happen to be, or his successor, excuse me, which didn't happen to be, of course, another uh, climate change denying Republican. Um, so, so the United States is <coughs> fighting against uh, a collaborative effort around the world, um, really since the world got behind this idea that the climate system was uh, unequivocally warming. Um, and what really worries me is that the United States pours a lot of money into research and understanding of climate impacts around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and the concern that the United States has is this, the equatorial regions are going to empty out, okay? Uh, and for the United States, that means uh, we're looking at the Rio Grande, okay? Uh, for Europe, they're looking at uh, South Saharan Africa, uh, and for China, they're looking at Malaysia, they're looking at uh, the former Indochina, okay? Um, so our government is well understanding that, that this is a very real crisis, um, and, and, and we are at this point where I genuinely believe, and Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, we're beyond a point where we can uh, reduce our emissions fast enough to avert catastrophe now. Um, to a certain degree, sea level rise of, of, of multiple meters is locked in. I think we'll certainly get over, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, I'd say it's two, two meters by the end of this century, uh, which would be absolutely catastrophic. And, and Noah's, of course, predicting now nine to 11. <sighs> by the end of the history. It, it's like, it's it's so surreal when we talk about it and hear it, but we see it and it's happening. And 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 just, Jen, tell me, when, when you're, you have so much work you're doing on your next project, is any of, uh, is there an interlap, overlap in what you're doing for the next project and what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, we're putting together, I'm working uh, with Jan Wiley on the database of environmental change, and we are basically making dramas out of database searches, if you can believe that. Our first work, and we're trying to make these works like 20 minutes long, 
not much longer. Just keep them in nice little chunks. And they summarize different parts of the, the database. And the first thing that we're working on um, was mind breaking. And that really was the effect of different oh pollutants and all sorts of things on our brain. And now we're going to be doing mind breaking the physical factors. And we have the script and we've got it mixed and I'm starting to put um, the video together and the pictures and things like that. So um, this is kind of like a work that will never end because what we're seeing and especially Yan, Yan and Simon worked on this database of environmental change and it has like 80,000 curated, sorted, flagged articles at this point. And wow. it's starting to get in, it's kind of exciting because it's start. Yan has been working with various newspaper outlets who shall be renamed nameless at this point. And they're starting to see the value of this database because it's so easy to navigate. And so, and then also Harvard, um, education was was noted so there are places that i don't i don't see a database like this anywhere out there with like and he's putting like over 50 articles a day into it and each article is like curated and and cross flagged and put into you know and and everything like that and now we're doing these little videos just on various parts of the database so that's very engaging I guess it keeps me a little bit from despair because I don't know, it's kind of weird. Like, I mean, at least I feel like I'm active and doing mm -hmm. something. So mm -hmm. I'm putting my brain into it a little bit. I'm not thinking that my actions are going to amount to any change in the outcome. But you on don't a know. you don't know who you're going to touch and who's going to be enlightened and wake up and and then, and then uh, share the information, share it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why I think we do all of our stuff. I mean, I, I mean, that's why I uh, write all the time. This is a, this is a, basically, basically my, my job is to, is to write and do research on my own time. It's basically become my job of sorts. And I, I mean, it's the same reason, same reason, you know, Antonio does what he does at his school, his university. It's, I mean, I mean, you and Jennifer, you, you know, you did the, you know, the methane videos several years ago now. I mean, it's it's all about trying to, like, communicate knowledge and do some kind of action you feel at least respects what's happening and not just right. leave, let it ha let it be and just ignore it and pretend it's not happening. You know, it's, you know, there's no way I can really do that. There's no way I can watch the Arctic burn to the ground and not say anything about it, you know? No, of course no, not. I You're a meteorologist. Education. You yeah. see these things. <clears throat> well, listen, guys, it's been an hour, and I think maybe we'll look at a little bit more of the, the um, if you don't mind, the comments before we close, because um, we don't like to go too long because people then lose interest <laughs> and we, it's been a really good conversation i feel uh does anybody have something that they want to um put up before we we go kim says education yeah that's what it is i mean I, you know it became uh, my hobby passion i um what i do here is because of that, because of my love for everyone and animals and the community we've built. For me, it's really about community and it's about being with like-minded people that understand. And it's also about making others and bringing them in. Like I said, that was my purpose, I suppose, is just finding and meeting and bringing together in, in a social, I'm a social being. Let's see. Okay, Mike says the Arctic burning is a contributed global dimming. Mike, we could go into that for another 20 minutes. <laughs> um, and thank you, William, for joining us. I, I, You said it's a good conversation. We'd like to learn more about you. 
because I, I think it's maybe maybe one of the first times you've joined us. So thank you so much. And uh, guys, everybody has, um, and I'll start with uh, Antonio closing for the evening and then Nick and Jen, and I will say goodbye. Well, thank you guys again for tuning in. It's, it's always been great to talk about uh, <laughs> the most situ serious of situations, but I think it's important that we hear each other's voices. We all have voices and part of being compassionate, part of being loving, part of being caring is to listen to each other. Um, and also to listen to yourself, listen to your uh, internal self, you know, um, and, and, and try to find your place in all of this. And I mean, when I say that, try to find your place amongst nature, uh, that which is left, try to find your place within your community and try to find your place among uh, the solutions that are out there. Um, and part of that you're gonna find is, is really all connected together. You're gonna find that nature, community, and, and your place in solving this are all really connected. Um, so thank you again for watching and I'll pass it off to you. Hey, thanks, Antonio. Well, what occurs to me is that this is just such a profound time that we're living in right now and that it's really a gift to be awake to our predicament and to be able to witness it in so many ways and to have the privilege of very easily communicating with like-minded people and forming virtual kind of like, you know, internet mental communities like we are and they're, they're just precious. And I appreciate everybody that I've met and it's it's really a precious gift to be able to communicate when I was first waking up to this the only thing I really wanted to do was to talk to somebody so thank you for that gift tonight mm -hmm. and that's what we have here Nick yeah um you know for me I, I we're in in you know some amazing times I mean you could call it amazingly disturbing, scary, or just, you know, just a, a time to, to wit bear witness to changes that no other humans ever seen before. And we're actually at a time where we can actually understand what's happening, at least to some, to some degree. And, and it, I think, you know, from, for me, and I think for a lot of people, the greatest benefit is being, is being able to have a choice to, do whatever you know you personally feel is right to to respect yourself and and your fellow humans, your fellow people in nature in any way you feel is right um, in a situation that you can't control. And I I think that's the emphasis that gets missed in all of this climate change discussion outside of our our sort of our realm. In, in sort of the mainstream is really understanding that we're dealing with forces that even if human humans have sort of ignited um, that they're becoming beyond our, our control. And we, and I think the best thing to do is to deal with what we can control. If you, if you feel being a vegan is the best way to do that and do that. If you feel that um, not flying is the best thing to do and then do that. If you feel that, at the end of the day, you just want to talk and communicate and, and write or do whatever it is or, or go protest, you know, um, every day, you know, go protest and, t and try to get a senator or a, or a representative to, to listen to you, a politician that gets oil money or something just to listen and start and admit that they're not doing anything. <clears throat> you know, whatever you feel is right based on your experience, your life, your age, whatever the case may be, right. um, do it because, you know, we're headed in, into, you know, darker times ahead, you know, and, and that's just the way it is, but we are here alive now. And, and you want to, you know, basically you want to, however you die, whether it's by some climate change disaster or by getting hit by a bus, you want to know that <laughs> you lived <laughs> doing what you wanted to do. Do, do to to let people know that that we're you know, we're in right. times and we should care about what's happening. You know, we have to care. Uh, whether or not how much control we have over, we have to we have to care about it. Absolutely, 
I, I want to thank you guys, and we will do this again. Everybody's asking. This is really very meaningful to me, and uh, this team is the dream team. Thank you, Antonio and Nicholas and Jennifer, and I'm going to say good night to everybody that joined us. Thank you so much. We, um, we're not the greatest at planning. We, we Usually what happens is, hey, wanna, something's happening, and let's get together, so watch out for us. We'll be back. <laughs> we'll be back. So let's do our little thank you guys. I do my peace sign. Thank Love you all, and good night, and share this.